name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. So this passage is very similar to an uh, even more familiar passage, uh, the Beatitudes, or the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and I think Luke is making a very, very intentional statement by how he tells the story. Because he would have heard Matthew's version, and the things that he changed matter. Uh, and if you look at it in uh, concert with some of the other things that Luke includes in his story, you get a picture of what Luke sees happening in the coming of Jesus in the flesh. Remember that Magnificat, that song of Mary, when she realizes uh, that she is with child and that this child will turn everything upside down. That a peasant girl is now the mother of the incarnate God. Remember the humble birthplace of Jesus and the first word going to the shepherds. Think of all that as you read this version of the Sermon on the Mount and realize that Luke is intentional about saying that Jesus spoke to his people from a level place. In fact, he says that, and then he says he looked up at them as he talked to them. That the incarnation to Luke is God becoming so much in solidarity with each one of us that God has to look up to talk to us. Jesus has rolled up his pants and walked into the muck of life. The two things that I think are pivotal to Luke. One, God is so with us that there is no part of the human condition that is beneath God. And two, that the world order that we live in is not God's dream for creation. That God dreams of things being turned on its side. Both of these are incredibly pregnant in this story. Uh, and Jesus also... Uh, puts it with a little bit more urgency and a little bit more directness. Uh, Matthew sort of talks eloquently about those who are poor in spirit. Luke says those who are poor now, those who are thirsty now, those whose stomachs are growling and they haven't had a meal now, that is who God is passionately invested in, and so should you. And if you're rich and don't have a larger vision of your responsibility as part of the co-creation of the universe of God's vision, then you're missing the boat. I think that's his message. And I've been thinking about that as I, um, I've really had uh, the people of Haiti on my heart and in my mind uh, over the past couple weeks, uh, the past eight days as the protests uh, have been going on there. Uh, and I think both of those messages resonate. Uh, with what's going on in Haiti. Uh, and I, I haven't talked very much about uh, our uh, desire to continue our, our relationship uh, with the people of Haiti. It's been, it's been somewhat complicated. It's been somewhat difficult. Um, we went to Haiti. We established a relationship. Uh, and then uh, because of a lot of uh, what's taking place in Haiti within the church, uh, the priest was no longer at that particular church. And then um, uh, we went back down, and we're still working on establishing a relationship uh, but the complexities of that are, in, in some ways, a microcosm of the larger issues uh, uh, going on in, in Haiti. Uh, basically, every church in Haiti is a mission church because most every church depends on the funding from the United States, uh, from New York uh, and our national offices uh, that funnel through the diocesan offices of Haiti uh, to the churches. And so each church is controlled by the bishop, where, um, where we have oversight of the bishop. The bishop doesn't control St. James, uh, but each church there um, and the clergy therein are controlled by the bishop, which makes things a little bit more complicated. Um, but I want to go back in the history of Haiti uh, to talk about something even more complicated. Uh, and I think that would be the Facebook status of our relationship, the United States and Haiti. Uh, it's complicated. Uh, we have been very generous, and uh, I think our hearts and affection uh, have been uh, at times in the right place, at times in the wrong place. Uh, but it goes back, our story with Haiti goes back a long, long time. Um, and I encourage you to read uh, about the history of the U.S. Uh, and, and Haiti, and, uh, and there's different perspectives. And I'm trying to, uh, uh, to distill in the middle of, the, uh, in the middle of those um, uh, 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 basically a synthesized uh, Cliff Notes version of it. Uh, so back to our revolutionary times, uh, Haitians fought on our behalf uh, in the Revolutionary War. 
Um, in fact, at that time, uh, uh, Haiti, um, as part of Hispania, was the most prosperous country in the Caribbean. Problem is, France enjoyed most of the fruits of that. Uh, and if you go to Haiti today, you can see that it came from a lot of uh, their natural resources that are not as, in as plentiful uh, a supply as it was back then. Uh, and when they won their independence, they became uh, the second republic in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, the second republic in the Western Hemisphere. And we didn't acknowledge them. We traded with them, bless you, and we took advantage of the fact that the rest of the uh, European powers weren't acknowledging them either uh, to create a, a fairly advantageous uh, trade relationship with them, but we didn't acknowledge uh, their autonomy and their republic because we had this sin going on in the United States of slavery. Uh, and if the people got word, uh, and it was widely known that there was a free republic um, uh, run up by former slaves, uh, just to the south of us, uh, what kind of uprising might take place in the United States? Uh, and so that was a good bit of the character of, of our story. And from the early uh, 1800s to uh, 1862, we didn't acknowledge uh, their sovereignty and their nationhood. Um, and in 1862, we did. Um, but the next big complicating factor in our relationship with them uh, was around the turn of the, the next century. Uh, in, the, in the early 1900s, uh, Germany uh, was uh, wielding quite a bit of influence uh, in Haiti, and a lot of uh, Germans were living uh, in Haiti, uh, and we were concerned about the influence that they might have as, uh, as they were rising to power, as World War I was, was starting to take root. Um, and so we decided um, essentially to uh, invade. And so we invaded Haiti. Uh, we took their gold uh, and stored it for safekeeping up, uh, um, up I think, in New York. Um, and um, we then decided to rewrite their constitution. Uh, we put a leader in power. We rewrote, rewrote their constitution. Uh, one of the things that was part of their constitution is that foreigners couldn't own property in Haiti. And so we rewrote that part of it. Um, uh, but it failed the legislature. So we disbanded the legislature, and so from 1915 to about 1932, uh, we occupied it. And, um, and some might look at it as a time of, uh, of creating uh, quite a bit of infrastructure and quite a bit of development in Port-au-Prince and some other places, um, but it was essentially chain gain la uh, labor, uh, and uh, what at first uh, might have been uh, at least somewhat benign. Uh, as our soldiers went off finally to fight World War I, uh, we brought in less trained um, uh, soldiers, and uh, during the Jim Crow era, uh, some of the treatment of the Haitian people, uh, to call it poor, would be a, a dramatic understatement. Uh, but if we believe that a butterfly flapping its wings halfway around the world can have an influence uh, uh, half a world away, our direct influence on Haiti and the psyche of the Haitian people uh, has to be acknowledged. Um, and uh, after we left, um, um, we continued to, um, uh, to, to wield influence there. Uh, and uh, as communism became our next big threat, because um, Haiti is so close to our shores and because of uh, a Cuban uh, uh, communist uh, regime, we felt that it was important that that country not fall into communist hands. So uh, even though we condemned some of the actions of Papa Doc and Baby Doc, um, we kept them in power uh, up until about 1990 uh, because uh, as bad as they were, they weren't communist. And it gave us a buffer uh, in that uh, the brinkmanship that we were involved in. Um, and then uh, beyond that, uh, we've continued to decide who would be a good person to put in power and who wouldn't be as good a person to put in power, uh, and even, I think, our best intentions uh, to improve the quality of life in, in Haiti haven't always been successful. Uh, sometimes we've taken our subsidized uh, 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 farming uh, here in the United States and we've given it to, to, uh, to the Haitian people, but that's devalued uh, their agricultural uh, uh, system there. Uh, and some of the other things uh, that, that we've done, uh, it's got more NGOs than any other uh, country, at least in this hemisphere, maybe in the world, I think. Um, but that uh, sort of undercut the government in some ways. And uh, you mix that with some of the corruption that already existed in the government, uh, and it created a, a very difficult formula. And certainly there's been corruption and there's uh, uh, been tremendous uh, uh, issues in, in, in being able to, uh, um, to mobilize and develop but uh, we have to realize that we've been part of the story the entire time. And uh, 
Um, and so now as we go down there, uh, I think one of the most profound things that we can do is roll up our pants and just understand uh, the effects that uh, that all of this has had on the Haitian people. And uh, what's led to the current, uh, uh, to the current uh, rioting, and, and people are, are quick to say uh, they're, they're doing damage to their, uh, to their own people, to their uh, own economy, uh, and some of that is true, um, but I think their battle cry is probably one of the most telling battle cries. It's, I'm tired. I'm tired. Uh, I'm tired of trying to participate in a democracy that doesn't seem to meet my needs. I'm tired of trying uh, uh, to innovate and then trying uh, to gain employment and still finding uh, the, uh, the good uh, dropping dramatically compared to the US dollar. Uh, I'm tired of being in a country so weighed down uh, by debt uh, with so little to show for it. Uh, one of the issues that's uh, uh, taking place right now is that uh, a, um, a very uh, friendly uh, agreement with Venezuela to, uh, to have very discounted gas that would be paid uh, much later at a very low interest rate, a 1% interest rate, uh, so they could use that money for development to help people after the earthquake um, uh, now is, uh, is without any funding. The, the, where, the, the people are asking, where is that $2 billion that was supposed to be there uh, to help uh, improve the quality of life uh, for us? Um, why are prices going up, um, our value of our currency going down, and opportunity uh, no better than it was, uh, it, or worse than it was years and years and years ago? We keep trying to move forward, uh, but we keep falling backwards. Uh, and I believe that the God that we see in this Gospel of Luke, who steps down, and comes down and says, I am with you. And this is not my dream for you. It's the same God that calls each and every one of us to say, you are my brother, you are my sister, and we are co-creators in God's vision for the world. So my wealth can't be at the expense of your poverty. And I can't enjoy and dance and laugh while you weep and cry for your children who have no opportunity or who certainly have far less. And that's got to cultivate something in us. So I don't know uh, where our relationship with Haiti is heading. I don't know exactly what it will look like. But I can tell you it's important. As important as it was that Jesus stepped down and said, I came into the world to be with you. And I call you to be with one another, to share this human life, to be co-creators in a much bigger, bigger dream that I have for all people, for all my children. Amen.